Okay, so today uh, we're going to go over materials. Um, I've got a file um, set up here, so we're going to go over how to create all the materials. I have all of the materials for this file already built in here, but we'll go through and um, I'll show you how, um, how I went through and did this. So if I throw this on realistic, it'll pop up and show me all the materials that I've got set up for this, uh, this project. So a couple of materials that we'll be going over, we'll go over the brick or the uh, stone here. Um, we'll go over the differences between the, the woods. So how did I get a horizontal grain here and then a vertical grain this direction? Um, and then also this uh, kind of wire mesh material that allows you to see through it, even though I did not model that um, as wire mesh. So if I go back to my hidden line, you can see it looks like a solid panel, but then when it renders, it will actually just render the wire mesh and be able to see through and see the bottles beyond. Um, so we'll go over each one of those, um, and then also why I have certain things as just plain white as well. So getting into this, um, we'll go over the, the wood materials first, um, and if I go to a, an elevation view here, so Let's flip this onto hidden line. And so what I've basically done is if I go into my my model in place family here, all of these are just made of um, solid extrusions. Um, so if I select this, each one of those is a is an extrusion. And I have used the split face tool that's right up here. So if you click on this, you can select a, a face and then sketch on it. So if I, right now, because I've already divided these, um, I can come in and place lines where I want to divide that face into separate areas where I can apply different materials um, to each one of those little spots. So once I've gone through and done that kind of all over the place, um, the only place it looks like I have not done that, and this will be a good instance of uh, how you go about doing this. I did not divide these right here. So if I divide that one and this one, because what I want to do is have a vertical grain here and a horizontal on, on these two, um, your rendering is going to look a little off and a little goofy if all of the grain in your wood is running the same direction. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. So now getting into the actual material, if I go into my materials tab with here. So I have a bar wood horizontal, bar wood vertical. You can name stuff whatever you want, but um, because there's not too many uh, materials in this, um, I've just named it something generic that just kind of gets to the point real quick. Um, so the way I created these is I came down here and I hit create new material and it creates a material and it its default is default new material right click it hit rename and I'll put a little dash and then you name it whatever you want the dash is important because then it'll automatically sort to the top so that way all of the materials that you are creating automatically jump to the top. If you don't put that dash in there, it's going to end up being lost amongst all of these. And it's going to be pretty difficult for you to find the materials that you've created um, amongst all of the kind of default and um, different materials down below that you probably aren't using. So I've created this new material. I'm coming over to this appearance tab. Um, the graphics tab, the difference between these two, uh, the graphics tab is what it will appear to look like in your hidden line view. So right now, I don't have any surface pattern or cut pattern assigned here, so um, which is probably what I want. I don't want to show like a wood grain pattern on all of this. That would get really busy really quickly um, and make it kind of difficult to see what's going on. So I don't have a surface pattern um, on here. Um, a cut pattern. I m may want a cut pattern depending on how I want uh, what my construction drawings and that sort of stuff to show. 
Um, so if I throw a cut pattern on here, I could show like any sort of hatch pattern. I could do a solid fill like we do for the poche here. Um, any of that sort of thing. Um, then whenever I have a section view that cuts through, so if you're looking at this little piece right here, that's an extrusion as well. And since we're cutting through it, that would be hatched with whatever um, hatch pattern I created there. And then how dark it is, is dependent on this color here. So right now, my wall has a material. Um, so right, let's see here. Down here. So this poche wall pattern has no surface pattern, but it has a solid fill. And then I've assigned the solid fill to be this gray. So it comes in, uh, just solidly fills the wall in this gray. Um, if I change that to black, then it's going to change this hatch pattern. Uh, instead of that fill being a dark gray, it's going to change it to a black. So you saw it change slightly. It doesn't show it as true black because I'm in this editing mode. Um, but if I backed out, it would change it to, um, to a, a solid black. So I'm going to revert that back to the way it was. Um, so <clears throat> getting back to this new material, I'm not going to set a surface pattern um, or a cut pattern uh, for this particular material, but then if I flip over to appearance, it gives me this generic material here. If you don't want to create your own material and you want to use something that's stock um, and native to Revit, you can come up here to this replaces this asset button, and when you open this up, there's an appearance library here. Now, if you hit this little arrow and see the drop down, there's a whole bunch of categories of different materials. Very few of these materials that are built in here are actually uh, already set up in your file. So if there's a material that you're looking for that you know isn't already in your file, it might be over here in these. Um, some of these are okay to use uh, if you want a decent rendering. Others, I would tend to stay away from and then build your own, which we'll get to in a second. But there's all these categories that you can find for different um, different materials that <clears throat> that you might want. So whatever, whenever you get into these, um, you just come in and say, I want Beechwood Amaretto here. Um, I can just double click on it and it will automatically bring that in over here uh, as that material. So if that's what I wanted, I double click it, it brings it in, I hit OK, and we're good to go. Um, but I want to use that default, um, so I'm going to use that generic. So it comes in with this big um, kind of gray orb here, and you can drag this down to see it a little bit better. Uh, in our instance, we probably don't want to see our texture as an orb. We're not going to be using it in that. So we can come to this, uh, this scene setting here and change it to something like walls. So that way, instead of an orb, we're seeing it on more of a flat surface kind of thing. Um, the chair sits here so that you can see how reflections work. So if you do um, a reflection on your material, you'll see the reflection of the chair in there. So you can kind of gauge certain stuff based on that. Um, so for our wood texture, um, I don't want it to be glossy. Uh, I don't want any reflectivity on it or transparency or cutouts. Um, Self-illumination, I definitely don't want my wood to glow. Uh, bump maps we'll get into with the stone, and the cutouts we'll get into with the, the, um, the wire mesh there. Um, and then tinting, tinting is if you, have a, if you have your image in here and it's just not quite the color you want, you can throw a tint on there and it takes that color and applies it across the entire image. So I'm going to come in and it says no image selected. I'm going to click on that, and then I'm going to browse. I have a textures folder. Um, these are just textures that I have built up over time. I would recommend that you do something similar, uh, where you just start finding materials on Google Images. Um, you can search for you know wood texture. I usually throw uh, the word seamless on the end, um, because the way these textures work, it's going to take the image and then just place the same image right next to it over and over again. So if I come into this wood texture, let's say, um, let's say we use, I forget which one I actually use, but let's say we're going to grab this one. So as you can see here, um, 
it applies to this wood texture, but I'm getting some what's called tiling, where you see the same little pattern over and over again. Um, it's getting a little bit too like patchwork. So I can come in here and click on this little drop down and hit edit image. And now under this edit image, it says, okay, how big is this sample that you're giving me? And this says it's a one foot by one foot sample. I can come down here and change that if I want to. Usually with stuff like this, you probably want to go a little bit bigger uh, just so that you're not seeing, especially like this little V pattern here, you're going to see that over and over and over again as it tiles. So let's say we make this like a two and a half foot um, sample here. So now if I hit done, now that's not tiling near as badly. And in my instance, there's not very often that I'm going to get a two and a half foot section that's just uninterrupted. So I'd have, a, if I put two and a half feet on here, I'm not going to see that tiling because it ends from here to here. It ends here to here. This might be the only one that I really have any issue, but that's not going to be too big of a deal because it's only going to tile twice. Um, if I get like three, four in those instances, that's where you get a problem. Um, so something like this, applying it to a wall might not look quite so great. So um, if I, I've applied my wood texture, I've set the, um, the size and everything, and for the most part for that material, I'm good to go. So I'll hit OK. Now to apply it to these two sections here, I'm going to flip this on realistic mode so I can see my materials. And it might be a little dark on your screen, but I'm going to try and zoom in here so we can see this a little better. Um, so right now, I've divided this. I've got a section that's going horizontal. When I divided this up, it broke this into the horizontal and this into vertical. So I want to go through and change that. So I'll come into Modify, and there's this right below that split face tool we used earlier is this paint tool. So I'll click on the paint tool, and I'll find the material that I want. And I'm going to use what I already have here in the bar wood vertical and bar wood horizontal. So if I click the bar wood horizontal, basically I'm just going to, I'm not going to change anything about the, the um, extrusion that I've created. Basically all I'm, all I'm doing is changing, I'm throwing a, a painted surface on top of this and changing the material in this one little section. So bar wood horizontal, I click that in, now my grain goes horizontal. And the reason for that is where, what I've done is I've created two identical materials. So the materials that I have here for barwood horizontal and barwood vertical are the exact same. So they look the identical. The only difference is barwood horizontal has a 90 degree rotation applied to it for the image. So I just took that image that I've applied and threw a 90 degree rotation on it and that's the only difference in those materials. That way they render the same um, and it shouldn't be a problem. Now for whatever reason, this one, if I apply a vertical to it, now it goes vertical. Now we need to apply a similar thing here. So that one looks like it's already flipped itself to going horizontal, so I'm good there. This one has a bunch of things that are going vertical. I, I don't want to paint everything going all the way around that. Um, I have to paint every little surface, but I can click on this and just say, okay, I'm going to change this from barwood vertical to horizontal. It'll apply that throughout the entire thing, and now all of the wood is running the correct direction. So little things like that make a difference um, when you're doing your renderings. Uh, when you get used to it, it, you can do it fairly quickly, and it doesn't take up too much of your time, and the difference that it makes is pretty large. Um, so moving on from the... Uh, the wood texture, we'll get into this uh, wire mesh here. So the wire mesh is essentially the exact same thing, only one difference. So I've gone through and I've applied a basically a chain link fence image to this. Um, I'm not sure why it's showing a, a wood orb for us right now. Let's change this to a wall. So there we go. All right, so, and then I've applied some, a little bit of reflectivity to it. It's a metal. It's probably going to be like a stainless steel, little shiny kind of thing. Um, 
So <clears throat> I've applied a chain link fence material to it, and then I just I just made the size of it small. So that way each one of these little uh, gaps is only like an inch wide, something like that. So then I came down, added a little reflectivity, kept the glossiness um, up a little bit. That way it gets the, the kind of texture um, and kind of shine to it. Um, but then I applied a cutouts image. So the cutouts image is pretty much the exact same image as um, the first one that I applied, only this one is just black and white. I've taken all of the color out of it, um, and in this instance, because there's a white background, I could just take this into Photoshop or something and darken it so that all of the little, um, all of the actual like chain link is black and then the background is white. So when you apply something like this, it's looking at the image and trying to determine what's, what are, what are the black areas, what are the white areas. Now this is the image that I applied here, and then the areas that are the black space are what it's going to cut out, and then the white areas are what it's going to leave. So I want to invert that and make it the opposite. So you can see how this is updating back here. If I turn invert, invert image off, it comes in and makes, you know, all the like what I want to be holes. It wants it makes those solid. So if I hit invert, it changes that. Always make sure that your material image and then your cutout image are set to the same sample size. Otherwise, you're going to end up with kind of a weird um, situation where the material that you're showing on this one is actually getting cut out in various spots because of this. Um, so you want those two to match up in terms of their size. So as soon as I apply that, it does the cutout for me. So in terms of creating an, a, uh, a material that kind of reads like that, it's fairly easy to do um, and it saves you a lot of time because it would have taken a lot of time to basically create a wire mesh in, and model that in there. So that is basically your wire mesh texture. Now getting into the stone material. So Let's change this to our walls. <clears throat> okay, so there's the in this everything that I say for stone pretty much applies for brick as well. Um, there's a default. Uh, let's create a new material and I'll show you. Whoops. Loading. Okay. Here we go. All right, so there's a default in Revit for brick. Um, so if I come in here and come down to where's masonry. So I can apply this brick texture. There's a bunch of different ones. Um, there's a running bond. That'll work. Um, that you have here. Now, there's not near the options in these defaults and under the relief pattern you see there's this 0.15 and I can crank that all the way up to 2. Now what this relief pattern does is it determines the light and dark spots in the image almost like the cutouts only instead of basically eliminating those from view it takes those and creates a three-dimensional um, image from it. So in this instance, the dark spaces are moving back and the light spaces are moving forwards, which ends up creating something that looks like the grout lines are sitting back from the face of the brick. So, and then the amount at which you crank this up is the amount, the kind of intensity of that difference between the lights and the darks. So the more that you crank this up, the more the grout lines are going to kind of set back and the more the face of the brick is going to sit forward. Unfortunately, only being able to crank it up to two is not that much. It doesn't give you the kind of relief that mm, a lot of the time that you would want. Um, so I, I would say 99.9% .9 of the time, I stay away from the defaults in Revit because this is just never going to cut it. That 2.0 is just never going to get you there. Whereas if you use the generic um, material and create your own, 
Then in the bump, you can crank this all the way up to 1,000. So now instead of two, you get 1,000. So if I had this at two, that stone reads a lot flatter than it would otherwise. And once you get shadows and stuff like that playing on it, it makes a huge difference whether it's two or whether it's, you know, 80. So there's 80, and then let's crank this up to like 200. It starts to get really bumpy um, in there and really kind of take on some texture. So the ability to control that a lot more than zero to two is a really nice thing to have in your material. So what I've done here is I've basically come in with my generic material. I've applied a stone texture here. Um, and then taking off the glossiness, there's no reflectivity to my stone, there's no transparency, I don't want any cutouts in it, um, I'm not using any self-illumination. Uh, since I don't have any um, materials that are self-illumination, I'll show you what this does. Um, basically self-illumination, you turn this on and it makes your material emit a little bit of light. So instead of a light fixture or something like that, if you just had, maybe you have some sort of surface um, that you're going to evenly illuminate from behind it. Um, it has like a translucency to it. You could, instead of uh, placing light fixtures behind it, you could create a material that actually glows um, itself. So that's an option as well. But then I've turned on this bump map and I've taken this material that I've applied up here and made it black and white and then applied it down here. So now the black and white image is being used to create this textured surface. Um, same thing with the cutouts, you want the size that you set this image to to be the same as that size, otherwise the kind of bumps and the texture aren't going to line up with the actual image itself um, up here. So that's in a nutshell the, the stone bump maps um, and all of that. Now getting into some other things that I've got on here, I have a white um, texture on here, so I'm using the white texture on my um, on my walls, and then on this little uh, beam here. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to apply like an old wood texture to it. I could apply it in Revit if I wanted, or um, or if I want to be able to control this just a little bit more in the post rendering process, uh, I'm going to leave it as a white. Um, the reason for that is. So if I apply a material as just plain white in Revit and then render it with my lighting and that sort of thing, I can come in in Photoshop and overlay an image or a texture or in the case of my walls, maybe I don't know exactly what color I want these walls to be yet. So I'll render them in white and then I'll overlay my color in Photoshop, throw that layer that has the wall color that I want in Photoshop on multiply and it'll automatically let all of the shadow and everything come through perfectly. Um, ends up being a real seamless uh, kind of look. So I recommend doing that whenever you, you're not sure on something. Um, I like doing it for clients and that sort of thing where if they're not sure on a wall color, I can bring the image into Photoshop and the client and I can sit there and just drag sliders back and forth until we hit a color that they like, eye dropper off of it, and then figure out what paint color that is from wherever you're going to get your paint. Um, so that's just the way that I typically like to do it. And then things like this where it's a small little item, doesn't take me long to Photoshop something over the top of it. That way it, I don't have any instances of tiling. Um, I can grab whatever texture I want off the internet. It doesn't have to be a perfect texture. And then I can manipulate that in Photoshop in five minutes and have have that overlaid, throw it on multiply, I get the right um, get the right shadows and everything going too. So in the end this uh, ends up rendering fairly nice. Um, so that's in a nutshell um, materials. Uh, so we've kind of gone over a couple different things. So I've got the stone, and actually let's throw a, a surface pattern on this stone. That way we can see what that looks like. So I'm going to go into surface pattern. There's model patterns, and then there's drafting patterns. So the difference between the two, a drafting pattern 
Um, like, let's say we throw a diagonal crosshatch, and it's going to stay that gray on our on our stone here. So I'm going to throw this on hidden line. So now I have this diagonal crosshatch um, applied here. Drafting patterns, if I change the scale, let's say I bump it up to one inch equals a foot instead of a half inch, drafting patterns scale with your view. So as I as I switch my scale back and forth, the scale of the actual um, pattern is going to change. Whereas model patterns will not do that. They are going to stay true to their size. So if in this instance here, so if I were to measure between these two lines um, at half inch scale, and let's say this comes out to be, you know, something like two inches or something like that, if I, when I flip this onto, so if I measure between here and here, so that's like three inches, and then I go to a one inch, now that's probably what, like an inch and a half? Yeah. So that scales appropriately with this. Depending on what you want, sometimes you don't want that. You want this to read according to the scale of everything else. So a model pattern is going to stay, so if this was a model pattern, this three inches, when I flip that scale, it's going to stay the same scale as all of this other stuff. Um, it's not going to change at all. So if we go back into our materials here. So in this instance for stone, I probably want something more along the lines of a, like a model texture, which is why your like brick um, and CMU block and stuff like that is all under this side because it's not very often you want that stuff to scale um, kind of weird. Um, you can bring in you can bring in um, AutoCAD um, uh, patterns that maybe you have before. Uh, so, like, let's just say we create a new drafting pattern here. I'm going to go over to Custom and Import. And so, if I go to my Textures folder, I have um, some old CAD f files, and we'll throw this cobble field on there. Now, when I bring this in, if I say this is at one. I'm going to end up with a huge texture, so one inch equals one inch, because this is a drafting pattern. I'm at half inch equals a foot, so I probably want to shrink this down quite a bit, so maybe somewhere in the, and this is a pretty big texture to begin with, so let's say we apply like a 0.4, and I'll hit OK, OK. Point, the reason I went 0.4 and not 0.5 since it's half inch is just because the scale is pretty big for this stone. And even now at 0.4, that's probably still a little too big for what kind of stone I would use on the back here. Um, so you can come back in here and change this uh, and say, edit, okay. I'm going to bring this in again and say, okay, let's say I want like 0.25. That's probably a little bit more in line um, with what I, what I actually want. Um, yeah, so that looks a little bit nicer. Now, if you don't want the stone to read, or maybe you want the stone to read even heavier, I can change this to a black and hit apply, and then you'll be able to see over here all the all the line work on the on the stone will change to a little bit heavier black line. I don't tend to like that just because all of my other lines end up bleeding into it. Um, but maybe you want it to be a little softer, go with a little bit lighter gray. Um, that way it's there, but it's not too heavy handed, um, depending on how you want your, your documents to look. Um, you can kind of play with that back and forth. So um, that's your surface pattern. Cut patterns work the same way, only instead of seeing them in this type of instance, you see them when you're cutting through something. Um, so in a nutshell, that is materials.